Right? Last week, we, we went over the spiritual act of worship, the spiritual discipline of worship, and how it says in Hebrew, do not neglect meeting together, right? but meet together. Right? Not just because like, oh, we want to be one giant club, but because in meeting together, we're reminded of the gospel that we believe in. This is why we go to church. It's not because all oh, the songs are cool or the praise team is, is great or because, you know, Pastor Fabi speaks with, you know, magical words and, you know, you get butterflies in your stomach when you hear him. No, that's not the reason why we come here. Right? We come here because when we all gather together, we're supposed to be reminding each other and reflecting on each other, towards one each other, the gospel message. That's why we gather together as a church. Right? And so when believers don't meet together as we've all faced in quarantine, we, there's a Huge decline on our faith, isn't there? Why? It's because no one is reflecting the gospel to each other. This is why we meet together again. Right? The spiritual discipline, the corporal, the corporal discipline of gathering together in worship. Now next, we're going to find this next spiritual discipline. Sorry, my tongue is kind of twisted. Right? We're going to find this next spiritual discipline kind of weird and kind of hard. But it's confession. Right, confession, you know, and everyone knows what this is. It's not Usher. It's not my confessions. No, it's not that. And if you're a 2000 child, you don't know. But that's the number one song by Usher. These are my confessions, right? But it's, it's not that, right? It's, it's, well, it has something to do with that. Basically, if you know, the, <laughs> I don't know why, but if you know the premise of the song, right, Usher, right, he had an affair with this girl and he got her pregnant, <laughs> Oh, I know, right? Shocking. You should listen to it. It's amazing. Right? <laughs> but, but, you know, he, he gets this girl pregnant. And then the whole song is about how do I tell my now girlfriend that I got this other girlfriend pregnant? And he's feeling all this guilt. And the whole song is about my confession, right? How he's going to confess to his now girlfriend that he got his mistress pregnant. Ooh, scandalous, right? But that's what it is. But then there is some merit to that song. Not that you should go be having baby mamas everywhere, right? That's not the merit. That's not the theme of the song, right? The theme is that there is this innate desire to have the truth out, especially when you've done something that is not right, right? You know, it, it requires a very sociopathic person not to think that way. To think that their wrongdoings are okay, right? That's actually the definition of a sociopathic person, right? Is to, but this is what it is. Everyone here has the capacity to feel guilt. And we live in a generation where guilt is not a good thing. And I want to kind of counter that a little bit, right? Guilt is, not a, guilt is a good thing until the point where you keep dwelling in it, right? Guilt is necessary, right? If I, you know, slap David and I don't feel guilty, I am sociopathic, right? Psychotic, maybe, right? But if I feel bad after I deck him in the face, then there's my humanity, right? In a, in a little place, that's where my humanity is, right? And we all have that. It would be wrong if I didn't. And today, that's what we're going to have. We're going to have this moment. Not, we're not going to have a moment of confession. We're going to have a moment of understanding why confession is so important as a discipline, right? First, theologically, right? Why it matters to God. And second, I don't want to say practically, but communally, why that's so important, right? So I'm going to go over the first one. It's going to be really quick. And it comes from our passage today, which is 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And I'll just read it. You guys could follow along. Actually, no, I'll read first. You guys read the second, and we'll just ping pong back and forth. Right? This is what it reads. This is the message we have heard from him who declares to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Verse 6. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us, pur purifies us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Right, so theologically, the first thing that we understand is this, right? Why do we confess? It's actually quite simple. It's because it's in line with character of God. And, and I like this story. Like, no one really 
No one really pays attention to this part of the story of Joseph. But if you guys know Joseph in, in Genesis, right, he's this, you know, he's this little brat kid who, who sold as a slave. <laughs> I didn't want to say it like that, but he's this brat kid who sold as a slave by his brother, right? And he's, he's um, hired by Potiphar, right, to be his, like, manager, and he does such a great job. But one day, um, Potiphar's wife, right? Potiphar is this um, general surgeon, surgeon, general, sar, gen, war general, sorry. He's this war general who's, you know, in charge of many armies, right? And his wife has the hots for Joseph. You know, and she's like, ooh, you know, she's been listening to my confession by Usher, right? <laughs> she's been listening, and then she's, she, she has this hot for Joseph, and she's trying to seduce him. And she tries and tries to seduce him. Like, for months. Now, I don't know, brothers. I don't know if you're that strong. But (laughs) if someone's trying to seduce you for months and months, he's always stiff-arming her, like, back away from me, Satan, right? That's what he's doing, right? Until one time, right, she comes and she tries to take advantage of him. She rips out his clothes, like, tries to force him into, you know, having love, making love. Or, you know, she tries to do the dirty, right? And then this is what Joseph says. How can I sin against God? It's not even how can I sin against your husband. It's not even how can I sin against you. It's how can I sin against God. And that is the proper theology that we need to have of what sin is. Sin isn't just an act or a wrongdoing. It's who are you doing it wrong towards, right? Any sin that we commit and any sin that we act on and every sin that is in our minds is not an act towards just yourself or the person next to you or the person you're going to act towards, but it's towards God. Right? This is what it says, right? This is the message that we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him, there's no darkness, right? That means there's nothing that contradicts God's moral justice and standards. Right? God is the standard. That's the theological point, right? And when we sin, right, when we sin, we either are cast out from that light or we are changed back into it. Right. If we claim to have fellowship with him, but yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Right. If we claim to have fellowship with God, but yet live in darkness, we are liars. Right. And this is why we confess. Right. We confess because it is who it is. Uh, sorry. We confess because one thing, first things first, we sin against God and no one else. All sin is aimed towards God because God is light. In him, there is no darkness, right? He is the reason for everything. And if we fall away from that reason, we are sinning against him. Okay, that's, that's what it is. Okay, now I could go into further detail. What is sin? Okay, then I would spend three hours talking to you what sin is. And that's not, that's not the point, right? If you want to talk to me about that, we could have a separate conversation. You know, oh, I stole money from a robber. Okay, good for you, right? That's not what I'm talking about, right? What I'm talking about is the sin of I don't acknowledge God. That is sin, right? That my actions isn't God honoring. That is sin. That is what we're talking about today, right? Sin here, what we're talking about today is quite simple. Is am I honoring God? Are my words, my deeds, and everything I do, is it God honoring? Am I thinking of him? But the thing is, we see here very theologically, if we sin and claim to be a Christian, then we are not in him. And he's saying, I, and he's not saying like, oh, you know, you can't sin if you're a Christian. Okay, that's impossible. I sin. I sinned this morning. I looked at my dog and I went, man, I don't want to take care of you. Right? You know, it's quite simple, right? Everyone sins, even I do. You know, turn to your person next to you and be like, you a sinner. Right? <laughs> you know, you could try it, right? It's Cathartic almost, right? But, right? but that's what it is, right? Theologically, is we sin against God. That's, that's, that's what it is, right? The moment when you look at your, your spouse and you're, you just want to smack them or your partner, right? The moment that you look at your test and you're like, man, chat GPT sounds really good right now. <laughs> you see, at that moment... Right? When you look at work and you're like, man, I could, and you know you have a meeting, but you want to call off because you're lazy. You know, the moment when your parents do something and you just want to curse them out, right? All that stuff. Right? We walk in that. You know, we walk in that. 
But this is, this is what he says. And this is one of the most beautiful things why this is theologically so important. It says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Right? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Like you have to think about that. All it takes is for me to confess. You know, <laughs> I did sociology major as a as of my undergrad, and one thing that blew my mind as a social major is one thing that cops want is not justice, but it's confession. <laughs> you know, so if you you know go to if you go to and if you if you watch any Law and Order or CSI, what are they looking for? They're not looking for the, the criminal. They're looking for confessions, right? And God is not like that, right? We have this, we have this, this pre, preconceived notion of God being like this cop, like, oh, just give me your confession. Give me your confession, you know? And then he, like, you know, slams our head on the table. Give me your confession. Give me, you know, that's not who God is. You know, that's, that's Hollywood, if anything, right? God is a God who is just and he's willing to forgive, and we see that, and this is so important, because if you don't know this, you don't know God. I'm going to say this very clearly. If you don't know this, then you don't know, the, you don't know God. Because at the very center and the very core of God, his desire is to give and forgive. That is who God is. That's from Genesis to the end, is to give and to forgive. Why did he make the world? To give. Why did he go through all that through to revelation, to forgive, right? At the very center of who God is and his character, he desires to give and he desires to forgive, right? And if we don't understand that, if we don't know that in God's character, then we don't know how to walk in the light of who he is, right? How can you be more Christ-like to, to your friend who gossips? It's to be like Christ who gives and forgives, to forgive that person. How, how, how are you able to show your partner this love, unconditional love, to be like Christ? Well, you have to first understand to give and to forgive. Right? If you don't know that, then, man, you really don't, can't display the gospel to one another. Right? Confessions allows us. And the word confession here is quite simple. It means to admit. It means, it means to admit. Admit fault. Is to say, this is what I've done. This is my wrongdoing. I am not in the right. And sometimes that's hard because we have this arrogance and we have this pride that what I do is right, isn't it? And I'm going to tell you this. If, you're, if you sin against God, who do you think is right? <laughs> right? Ultimately, that's what it is. Is God a liar or are you the liar? Not, last time I checked, God is not a liar. Last time I checked, I lie all the time, <laughs> you know? More often than not. Right? But it's to admit that, man, maybe what God says is true. And if I'm not living according to that standard and that law, maybe I need to repent and I need to confess. Right? Confession is important. Admitting. Right? And if you've been in a relationship right, and you've done something wrong, you did a bad thing, you know that admitting and confessing is important. It's absolutely imperative. But we read this, right? And it's not, it's, not even, it's not even about our action of us confessing. But read who God is. He is justice. He is just and willing to forgive. That's who he is. It's not about what we do. That's one part of it. But the second part is who is God? He wants to forgive. And that's something I want to draw into your minds today is all we have to do is come and approach him. All we have to do is come before him. God, this is who I am. I'm right here. Simply that. God wants you to approach him. You know. That's theologically. Right? Now, communally. And this is where the spiritual discipline comes in. Because if you were to look to your neighbors, right, and I were to tell, all right, take five minutes to confess your sin right now, you'd be like, no, thank you. <laughs> right? You'd be like, no, right? Never. That's the discipline part, right? It's hard to. It's hard to sit down and be like, hey, Hanvi, this is who I am. She actually might like that. <laughs> I don't know. Right? But if I, were, 
Actually, he might like that too, right? But if I went to someone and to say, like, this is my burden, I wouldn't want to share the depths of my soul to a person. I'd be like, hey, Humvee, I kicked a kid. <laughs> you know? Like, that's awful, right? Like, you would be like, wow, who is this guy? Right? No one wants to do that. No one wants to come. This is why it's a discipline. Because we ought to. And if you read James, right? if you read James chapter 5, verse 16, this is what it says. Right? Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Right? The command here is quite simple. It says confess to each other. Right? Not because you want dirt on that person. Like, that's not the reason why we confess to each other. Right? We, we confess to each other so that we might be healed. Right? If anything, confession is the most liberating thing that we could feel as human beings. Right? Psychologically, it's so true. Right? What's the number one cause of, of you know, self-harm and suicide? It's guilt and shame. That's the number one cause. Well, next to depression, but that's correlated almost, right? It's guilt, and, it's guilt and shame and, you know, depression in there. But it's because there is something that we have done and we can't come to terms with it, right? The reason why there is a breakup is because we can't come to that term of guilt. We can't figure that out, right? But confession, and this is one of the most lovely things about confession, and this is why it's so important for us to do it, right? Because it levels the playing field for all of us. It levels the playing field for all of us. And I'm going to teach you two things. Right? This is the difference between religion and cults. Right? This is why I learned in sociology too. Right? But you know what cults do? Cults? Right? It's, it's quite simple. They, they run like religion. They're like, all right, confess your sin. But instead of, you know, instead of like having this brotherhood, all right, let's sweep that away, they use that sin to blackmail. Right? That's, that's the difference between quotes and religion. Right? You know, if David came up to me and said, like, oh, Pastor Fabi, I, I killed someone. Right? And he's just, looking to, he's just looking to have this pure heart, like this forgiveness. Right? Right? If I was a cult leader, I'd be like, hey, David, remember that time you confessed to me that you killed someone? Well, time to level up. <laughs> you know? That's what it would look like in a quote. Cults. Right? Right? In religion, it's this. It levels out the playing field. Is that when you confess to me, I am in no right to judge you because I am no different. Right? And I love this story that we read in Jesus. Right? We, there's a story of Jesus. He comes. Right? There's this religious leader coming up with this prostitute. Right? And they throw the prostitute to Jesus. And they say, Jesus, this person has broken the law. She's been sleeping around with many men. You know, and it's not her husband. The law says we kill her. We stone her. Right, Ooh. you know, right. What Jesus does is, you know, I don't know what he does. <laughs> I know, I know what he does. But he he starts writing on the on the on the dirt. We don't know what he writes. And after he finishes what he writes, he says, you know, those without sin cast the first stone. You know, and starting with the elders, you know, they drop the stone and they walk away. And then eventually, no one is there standing before this person, right? The sinner, quote an unquote sinner. And then she's just before her and Jesus, right? This prostitute, right? In the law, yeah, she broken a lot of, she broken a lot of, you know, laws, whatever, right? But before Jesus, right? And this is what Jesus says: You see, no one is here. I don't judge you. Go sin no more. Right? In that place of confession, where she knew that she has absolutely nothing before Jesus, like, man, I am a sinner. I do deserve to die. What, the, what does Jesus say? No, go and sin no more. Live your life, right? In that same mindset, right, he levels out the playing field from the righteous and the ungodly. And that is what the church is supposed to look like when we confess to one another. When we confess our sins to each other, we're saying, like, I am no better than you, and I love you for who you are. Right? That is the most beautiful thing that we could have, because guess what? We all long to have that healing, don't we? We all long to have that guilt. free. We long for that freedom. How many times have you been chained by guilt and it didn't allow you to live freely? Confession allows you to live like a free person. Right? The reason why we don't confess is because we carry it like a chain. We carry it like an like a iron ball, like this is mine. No, that's not what sin is supposed to be. Well, sin is supposed to weigh you down, but you're not supposed to live that way. 
Right? When we confess to one another, right? right? Why? So that we may be healed. It's not, it's not for shame. And I'm not going to be beating around the bushes. It's painful. Right? It's painful. It's not easy. Right? It's not easy to confess what wrongdoing that we do. You know, it's a lot easier to come before God, you know, and that's true, right? There's two types of confession. First is between you and God, and the second is what we're going over is us, right, between brothers and sisters. Yeah, you're saying, yeah, I could do it. I could do it between me and God. No problem. Yeah, I could go on my knees and pray to God, God, this is who I am. Right? The problem where it comes is becomes where it's hard to do it amongst each other. Right? And I want to encourage you guys with this one thing. Church, you are the ambassador of Christ. Right? You are the royal priesthood that Christ died for. You have the ability to forgive sin and forgive sinners. You're like, what? Yeah, it says in John 20, right? if you forgive other people's sin, they're forgiven. If you withhold, if you withhold sin, then they're, they're not forgiven. Right? You and I have the ability to forgive sin. We're, we're able to speak on God's behalf. When someone comes before you and lays down their burden, we're able to Forgive them and confess to one another so that they may be healed so that we can pray for them. See, that is such a powerful thing that we have as Christians. Man, have you ever seen someone so broken by what they've done? Like, have you ever seen someone who, who just couldn't live with themselves for the acts that they've done and they just want someone to tell them, you're forgiven? In fact, have you ever been in a place where you're able to forgive someone else? How liberating that is for your soul. Right? And this is the problem. This is the, this is the issue that we run into as Christians, that we don't walk this way. Therefore, And this is why we're confused, why our faith isn't growing, and why we're always in this place of you know, downward spirals in our faith. It's because we're not acting like Christ in this way. We're confessing sins and forgiving others. Church, you are no longer chained by the sins that you are attached to. You are free from that. This is, a, this is the truth that I want to proclaim to you today. Right. And some of you guys might be like, no, Pastor Fabi, there are some habits I can't break out of. Yeah, I get that. But that doesn't mean you're not forgiven. Right? It's a gradual process. It takes time. And I say this, and I, tr I try to be as clear as I possibly can because our duty as a Christian to walk in discipline is also to confess our sins to one another. Because we're, we're putting our trust in, in God who entrusted us to be his reflection. Right? That's, that's something I want you guys to really think about. You know what? Has someone... Are there people in your life where you're able to be like, yeah, I could share this with them without any judgment? Because, not because of who they are, but because they resemble Christ to that extent. You know? That's, that's, what, it, that's what it is. You know, there is a spiritual discipline of confession. And it requires us to partake in it. It really does. Because it levels out this playing field that we're in. You know, who we are as people, we're no better than them. We're no lower than them. Right? It levels us up. Right? And that's something I want to encourage you guys. For those who feel like, oh, I'm going to be judged. Oh, I'm not going to be loved here. This is the last place you, f you should feel that way. And if you do feel that way, come tell me. I'll tell them up. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Here is where there is no judgment. We confess freely simply because there's a duty to it. Right? If the church can't do that, then where can we find that? Again, if Christians can show that, where are we to find that? If Christians can come up freely and say, this is the sin I've committed, and not live like a free person after that, 
then we don't know the gospel. Right? Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to beat around the vision and saying this is easy. Now go confess your sin. <laughs> you know, that's not what I'm saying. Right? What I'm saying is, have you took that leap of faith in trying, and have you, have you felt the joy of liberation when that happens? Lastly, we read this, and this is one of the most powerful things. It says, it says, pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Right? This verse is not about confession. It's about prayer. But in that confession, right, what sets us apart from the rest of the world is that we pray and we entrust our burden and our pains to God. Right? Because if I confess without praying, then David and I are just gossiping. <laughs> Right? That's ultimately what it is. Right? If, I, if I'm talking about someone else's sin and what they've done against me, I'm just gossiping. Right? What makes a difference is when we bring up to God and say, this is my problem and I need help. Right? Prayer is where we invite God into all that. All right. Now I'm going to address the elephant in the room because it's hard to do it and it requires a lot of patience. So how do we do this practically? This is the only way I thought about. Shake them until they tell you. No, I'm just kidding, right? The only way you, you, you find this out is, is actually simple. You have to be first to admit, I need help. Even though when you can't admit what it is, you know, like let's say like this never happened. So, you know, like, oh, I cheated on my wife, right? And I had a hard time saying that. And I, and I go up to David. I'm like, David, I, there's something I need to tell you. Right? It's killing me. Right? It's really hard for me to say. Right? And I can't get it out. And most of us might be like that. Right? Most of us might be in this place, oh, you know, I did X, Y, and Z, but you can't share it because you want to, but you can't because you know, you know it's so painful. Right? Then it is my job to tell David, I need your help. Right? And David's job would be to interrogate me, not in a violent way, but like, is it about this? Is it about this? Is it about that? Right? And I would only go to David because he would know me as an example. Right? He would know me well enough to be, to be able to interrogate me and who I am. Right? In the same way, another example might be more realistic. If Elliot came, to, came up to me and Elliot would be like, oh, Pastor Fabi, I've committed a sin, but I, I don't want it to say. Right? This is what I would tell him. Is it about dental school? And he would say, yes. Did you cheat? Yes, right? Like, that's how it would work, right? You would interrogate them, right? Not out of spite, but simply so that you would help them say what they need to say so that they could open up a conversation. Does that make sense? Right? So they could be like, oh, okay, the big picture is out of the bag. Now we could talk about this freely. Right? And this is why it requires a discipline amongst community because it can't be done with someone you don't trust or someone you don't know. Right? It requires someone you trust fully and love deeply in order to act and do, to do that. Right? But this is what I'm going to end with. And this is, this is, again, this is me trying to be as insensitive as possible. It is hard. I'm not going to say just do it. You know, not get your way through it. No, it doesn't work that way. But I have to, I have to show you this illustration. No guilt and shame is ever good for you when it stays too long. It becomes like cancer. And if you know what cancer, how cancer works, it's not just like one little cell. It's multiple cells that grow on top of each other. At least that's the way I explain it to myself, right? They, they just multiply within each other, right? That's kind of like how cancer works. In the same way, guilt and shame and sin, that's how it works. It just goes on top of, top of each other. And in order for you to get rid of that, do you think it's a joyful thing when you do? Of course, right? It is a joyful thing. If I, get, if I have a huge tumor on my stomach and I got rid of that, yay, let's celebrate, <laughs> you know? It would be great if, we, if, 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 you, if, that got, if I got rid of that, right? But is it not going to be painful? No, of course it's going to be painful. Of course it's going to be so heart wrenching, pain staking activity. It's like going under the knife, right? That's what it is. It's a surgery, right? To cut off a sin in your life that you have been cultivating since you were young. 
to cut that off isn't going to be like smooth sailing. No, it's surgical work. You got to cut it. You got to get rid of it. Then you have to heal from it. But first, you have to get rid of it. You have to cut open yourself, right? And it requires someone to say, cut me open and take it out of me because I can't do it myself. Right? That's what confession is like. Right? Confession is surgery. It's admitting to the doctor, I really need you because I can't do it. Right? I tried my best to get this tumor out. I can't do it. Can you do it for me? Right? Sin is a nasty thing. Sin is something that we cultivate since childhood. In fact, it becomes habit sometimes. Right? Confession is the remedy for it. And we are able to confess simply by this one truth that we know and we love a God that likes to, that desires to give and that desires to forgive. That our confession is not used to aim back at us as, as black male, but it's there to liberate us, to free us from, our, from the thing that weighs us down. And church, this is what I want to encourage you guys with as we confess to one, each, to one another, to each other to be reminded of the truth that God is faithful and just and he'll purify us of all unrighteousness. Do you believe that? If you do, then you have the freedom to confess when you believe that God is faithful and just. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you today simply as sinners, Lord. No. <laughs> I don't come into the pulpit because I'm better, Lord. I, in fact, I know, I know my sins. I know my flaws. I know my heart, Lord. <sighs> Lord, and this is where I confess, Lord. I need you infinitely more. And the beauty of all this, Lord, is that you invite us to come to you. You invite us to come into your presence. You invite us to come into where you are because you want to forgive. Lord, that when we confess our sins and our wrongdoings, you don't see a sinner, but you see Christ. And Lord, that's something that we want to understand deeper and deeper, Lord, that, we, that you don't see just a sinner, but you see your son. And that is why we're able to come before you freely, and that is why we're able to come before you wholeheartedly and worship sincerely, because Lord, we know you, God, are the God that takes our confession and turns them into blessings and testimonies. So Lord, as we might reflect on that today, will you free us from the things that hold us down? Lord, thank you in your holy name we pray. Amen.
Jesus, you are a wonderful Savior, and there's no one like you. That despite all the sin and all our brokenness, yet you still choose to love us unconditionally. And it's not just, oh, I love you, it's I'm willing to show you by dying on the cross for you. Right? That's, that's who we worship, and that's who the God that we come and sing these wonderful songs about and what we listen to in the word of God is that you are this wonderful God. And Lord, if there's any pride or arrogance in our hearts to think that we're better, that we're in no need of a Savior, then Lord, will you gently humble us and remind us that we are in need of community so that when we confess our sins to one another, you are faithful and just and you will forgive us of all unrighteousness. That when we confess our sins to each other that, and pray for one another, that you will heal us because a prayer, a prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, Lord. And we come believing that, Lord. We come believing that we want to be able to reflect the gospel to the person that sits next to us and across from us. If not, then we're not a church. So Lord, teach us to do so. Lord, thank you so much. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Let's give glory to God.